Good morning. Hope you're all doing well. I'm excited to uh, start a new series with you today with my friend here. This was actually just traced around me. Um, so it's a life-size Adam. Not exactly. We'll get to it in a bit. Uh, we're going to start a new series today called Cut It Out. But first, I wanted to follow up a little bit from last week. Last week, we had Micah Davis and Jake Hirsch here from the Sanctuary, a new church that's launching in Broad Ripple in September. And uh, they just did a great job contributing to our gathering. And, and Micah gave a very challenging message. I thought that was uh, wonderful and well-received. And so uh, thanks for being good hosts for them. And you're going to hear more about ways that we're going to partner with the Sanctuary Church next week. We'll talk some more about that. But today we're going to get into this conversation um, about things that get in the way of uh, us moving towards Jesus-centered living that just just need to go. They just need to be cut out of our lives. Uh, I typically like to speak more on the positive side of things and talk about like how we uh, should love people well and be kind and humble and but sometimes you, you have to address the things that are wrong so that we can deal with those too. And so that's what we're going to do for the next few weeks. So if you've been waiting for a time to plan a weekend trip away, this is a good time uh, to get, get out. If this message doesn't hit you between the eyes, next week's will or the one after that. So it's coming. Just be prepared for that. But we're going to talk for you through a few things. And uh, I want to give you a picture of what kind of uh, counselor that I, I aspire to be and, and the way that I would approach this with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, just watch this video. It'll tell you, tell you that. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm... Uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you... you, you you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> it is. Then stop it! I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, childhood. No, no, no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good go. Okay, yeah. So you're not signing up for counseling with Adam anytime soon. Uh, no, that's not a good. That's not a good counselor, by the way. That's not good therapy. We would. We don't condone that. But isn't that what you want to say to people sometimes? Uh, maybe your children. Uh, sometimes you just want to kind of grab them by their little collars and say, "Just stop it." You know. Um, so sometimes we need to do that with ourselves. We need to look in the mirror. We need to recognize the things in us that need to be cut out. We just need to cut them out. We just need to cut those things out, and uh, it's painful, and it hurts, but it's necessary for us to be healthy, and so we're going to look at some of those things over the next few weeks. The first uh, one we're going to talk about is dishonesty. We're going to talk about how dishonesty 
uh, really just undercuts our relationships, and not just as individuals, but as a church family. And so when we talk about the impact of dishonesty, we're, we're not thinking only about ourselves uh, and what needs to be cut out of us, but as a church body. So, so our friend here represents us as individuals, but it also represents the body of Christ and how these things can have a negative impact uh, within the body of Christ. And so uh, to do, uh, to start from scripture, we're going to look at uh, one of your least favorite stories in the Bible, um, Acts chapter five, Ananias and Sapphira. If you know that story, you, you know that it's, it's, not, it's not encouraging, it's not uplifting, it's not great. And uh, you, might, you might just skip it sometimes when you come to it. Uh, because what happens in the book of Acts is we get this story of how the Holy Spirit sort of fuels the disciples of Jesus to establish the church and uh, healings happen and the gospel is presented and, and people um, all over the world really begin to come to Jesus and give their lives to Christ. And it's, it's just a very encouraging story. But then right here in chapter five, we get something uh, not so great. So, so let's get to that. Um, in, in, four, in Acts 4, there's a description towards the end of the chapter of the life of the church. And it kind of goes like this. Things are going great. Things are going great for the church. Everyone is sort of like-minded. They all have the same priorities. Uh, miracles are happening. People are being healed. Uh, things are like, um, th- there's reckless generosity is one of the trademarks of the church. People are selling their property. So they're just like selling their homes or their, their fields. They're bringing all the money and giving it to the apostles so they can distribute it to the needy. So there, there are no needs in the church. Everyone has what they need. And, and it's just an amazing time. And we get one person sort of gets um, highlighted here at the end of chapter four. His name's Joseph. Let's read about him. If you see something on the screen underlined, please read that aloud. Um, I just, I, you guys are this, our star students. Our first service is wonderful, sharp people, but they, they, they got, I caught them off guard with some of the underlined verses. You guys are not gonna get caught off guard, are you? No? Okay, good. I'm confident in you. All right, here we go. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. All right, so Joseph is just kind of held up as an example. This is what's happening. Here's this guy who sold, sold the property, brought all the money, and gave it away so it could be distributed to the poor. Uh, and, and, th- and then you're just like, this is a utopian society. This is This is too good to be true. This is exactly what it should look like when people who love Jesus are living in community together. And you kind of think, what happened? You know, where did where did we go wrong? I mean, if this is how things were all the time, well, it's not how things were all the time. When we get to the very next verse, this is why I wish there wasn't a chapter break here, because the chapter break makes it feel like you're starting a different story when really it's just a continuation of this narrative. After Joseph sells his property and gives it to the apostles. Uh, Here's what happens next. Uh, 5.1. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge, brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So you get this sense in the way, the way the narrative is flowing here that Ananias sees what's going on. He sees all this reckless generosity. He sees Joseph being honored and, uh, and he thinks like, I, I want people to look at me the way that they're looking at Joseph. I, I want to get a nickname from the apostles. I mean, Joseph gets this nickname, son of encouragement. And he thinks, well, I, I, what if they would call me son of generosity or son of, Ky-? I want to get my own nickname from Peter. I want Peter to see me walking through the church and go, there goes Ananias, that son of generosity. And just have this real positive um, reputation in the church. And so he sells some property and brings some of the money and gives it away. And, and our, our initial reaction is like, what's wrong with that? It sounds great. It sounds like he's doing a great thing. Well, let's keep reading. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that... Okay, hold on a second. Now, he did this really generous thing that he did not have to do. I mean, no one told him he had to go sell property and bring all the money. So he did it voluntarily, and he's standing before Peter. He's waiting for that, you know, way to go, Ananias. Good job, buddy. Um, what, can I give you a nickname? Is that okay? And instead, he gets, how has Satan so filled your heart? 
That is probably not what he was expecting in this moment, but this is what he hears. You have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? So this is turning into a very serious situation. Peter says, Satan has filled your heart, which is just a reminder that we all need sometimes that that we have an enemy who uh, wants to oppose the kingdom of God and the things of God. And so when you read something like the end of chapter four, when things are going great for the church, they're like-minded, there are miracles happening, people are coming to Jesus, they're being generous, the enemy goes, I gotta stop that, I gotta put a stop to that. And so how does he do it? He, he, he uses his favorite tool, deception, lying. Jesus calls him the father of lies and convinces Ananias to lie not only to the people but to God about what kind of person he is. Peter's issue is not that Ananias kept some of the money back. It was his money. He can do with it whatever he wants. The issue is he acted like he pretended like he was giving all of it when he was only giving some. He is demonstrating here something that, I mean, we're just so glad this doesn't exist in our world today, but this idea of like, he wanted people to think he was one kind of person when really he was another. That doesn't, I mean, I'm so glad we don't have that in our world, do we, right? He's more concerned about who people think he is than who he really is. Wouldn't it be terrible if we had that in our society today? You picking up on the sarcasm? I'm laying it on pretty thick. Okay, I think this is the temptation of social media, isn't it? The temptation is there for us to be more concerned about what kind of person people think we are than what kind of person we actually are. And this is, this is what Ananias is doing. So what should happen to someone who does this, who is presenting themselves in a false way to the church? What should happen to a person like this? We're kind of going, I hope it's nothing bad because I think I've done this, <laughs> right? I think I've done this thing. I think I've pretended to be something I'm not. So I hope the punishment is not that big a deal. I hope, you know, it's just a slap on the wrist and don't do that anymore and, and come back later. Uh, no, let's continue reading. Verse five, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Oops. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. You think? I mean, yeah, obviously, great fear. I mean, somebody, somebody told a lie, a, a pretty harmless, it seems in our minds, a harmless lie. I mean, it's a victimless crime. And the consequence is they die? Does that feel a little harsh to anyone? It should. It should feel a little harsh because I think most of us can kind of go like, if that's what should happen, I should be dead, right? Because I've done this. I've I've presented myself in a way that's not true. So what, why did this happen? Did Peter execute Ananias and Sapphira? No. No. He did not. That's not in the text. It doesn't say that Peter killed them or pronounced their death or anything like that. It happened right in front of him. Did God do this? Was this God's punishment? Maybe. Like, like yes, there's kind of an element where you go, well, yes, there's, there has to be some element of God's uh, action here. But the door is also open that, that when they're confronted with their sin in front of the whole church, in front of the apostles, these men who walked with Jesus and they're confronted with their sin, that they, they had some kind of physical traumatic reaction. They had a heart attack or a stroke and just died. I mean, that, that's possible. I think it's not really clear what caused their death. And so I, I don't think that's the part of the story we're supposed to focus on. I think what we have to recognize is that this is, this is a very serious consequence for something that most of us would not see as that serious of a sin. We would kind of look around and go, 
I bet there's worse things happening in our church than somebody pretending to be something they're not. So does that mean those people should die? Like, why, why is this happening? Why is this in here? Because it makes us want to skip this story. It makes us want to say, well, can we get back to the people being generous and miracles happening and all that? Can we just skip this part? But man, this is, this is built into the narrative. It, it's, it's interesting because, you know, Luke is writing this to someone he's trying to, he's trying to talk to about the way of Jesus. He's trying to share the gospel with the, the audience of this letter, this, this account. If, if you were trying to encourage someone to join your church and this had happened, would you tell this story? Nope. <laughs> you would not tell this story and say, hey, so yeah, last week, a couple people lied. They died. You should come this week. Yeah, it's, it's great. You never know what's going to happen. No, this is not great marketing for the church. So it has to be in here for a reason. And, and I think one of the things we're supposed to understand here is that there's no such thing as just an individual sin or a victimless sin in the church family. That, that what we do affects the whole body of Christ. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what dishonesty does. I want us to look at this passage from Ephesians 4, where Paul is, is talking about the life that the church is supposed to experience, and how do we get to that place that was described in Acts 4, where things are going great, everyone's like-minded, there are no needy persons among them. How do we get there? Here's, here's some of what Paul says about that. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must for we are all members of one body. Paul says, if you guys, if you want to have a healthy church community, you, you can't be false about who you are. You have to speak the truth about who you are to each other. You can't pretend. It, it impacts everybody when you, when you pretend to be something that you're not. Paul basically says, you gotta cut that out. So, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna do some surgery on our, on our friend here. Um, so my volunteers are gonna come and help me. Who's helping me? Okay, this should be interesting. So uh, we're just gonna cut out a part of our of our friend that represents not only us as individuals, uh, go for it, just do what you gotta do, make it happen. Uh, this was not rehearsed or anything, uh, and uh, I don't know how it's gonna go. So here's the thing about surgery, uh, is it's, it's painful, and so uh, how many of you have had surgery? You've had surgery of some kind, some of you even recently. Who's your favorite person at surgery time? Anesthesiologist. Anesthesiologist is the hero of the surgery, right? Why? Pain management. Like, I know it's not normal and natural for someone to cut into my body, so someone make it not hurt, right? That's what we want. So the problem is cutting something out that's harmful is painful. It creates a problem for your body. Is that loud to you guys? Because it's loud to me. All right. You get, oh, you're doing great. You're doing great. That's, that's a little wonky. It's all right. It'll be fine. More than a five-minute heads up would have been nice. Yeah, well. Hey, good job. Thank you, guys. Okay, so this is what Paul is saying is like you've got to, you, you have been made new in Christ and you've got to embrace that newness. You've got to cut out the stuff that is destructive and unhealthy for the body and you've got to replace it with something else. Truth, honesty. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. So, um, but surgery is, is, is painful, and that's why we don't want to do it. I, I had uh, a few years ago, seven or eight years ago, I was having a problem with my shoulder I, for about two years. It just kept getting worse and worse, and I got to a point where I, I couldn't raise my arm up above like here, and uh, I, couldn't, I was having trouble sleeping because of the pain, 
Um, and I knew I needed to have surgery. I know if I go to the, the doctor, they're going to tell me you need to have surgery. And so I just didn't go to the doctor because that's mature adult behavior, right? Um, so, um, but it got so bad, I finally went. I had the surgery that I didn't want to have. I went through the pain of recovery and therapy and the, the mean people at the rehab place making me raise my arm above my head when I didn't want to. And as a result of that, I get to do things now that I couldn't do before the surgery. So I help out with our high school tennis team, which I love. Before, I could not hold a racket. And, and now I can play tennis. I get to uh, play disc golf with my kids when they invite me, which they don't anymore because I'm too slow. But I, I couldn't throw a Frisbee before. Um, I get to, I get to renovate uh, house things around my house that require me lifting things above my head. I get to do that. Um, it, was, it was worth it. I have no regrets about having that surgery. Although at the time, I, I was not real thrilled about it. But it put me in a place, it gave me some freedom to do some things that, that, that I needed and wanted in my life. And so when we go to cut out something like dishonesty, if you think about it in terms of like, what would have to change in my life for me to not put on a false face in front of anyone? What would have to change? For some of you, that's a painful thought. You think like, well, if I start being honest about who I am, they're going to know that I wasn't before, right? And that's embarrassing. And it, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's humbling, even humiliating. It'll be painful. If, if that's what you have to do, it's gonna be painful. I just want you to know that. And I don't have a recommended anesthesiologist for that pain. I'm just telling you, it might be something you have to go through. But on the other side of that, if you cut that out on the other side of that surgery, there is a freedom. Can you imagine what it would be like? Hopefully you have people in your life that you, you can be completely yourself with all the time. Can you imagine the freedom of not having to put on a false face in front of anyone? There's freedom there. There's joy there. But for some reason, and this is so prevalent in the church, we have created this environment where we think, like when I come in here and I look around, everyone looks like they're fine. And so when somebody asks me how I'm doing, what do I say? I'm fine. I'm not fine, but everyone else looks like they're fine because I guess that's what you're supposed to do at church. And so I lie basically and say I'm fine when I'm not fine. And what I don't realize is you're all doing the same thing. Like we're all doing it. What if we didn't? What, what if somebody asked you on a Sunday morning, how are you doing? And you said, not great. I'm just not doing great. Life is not great. Things are not great. I feel terrible. Like, I, I'm not trying to say we, we, we need to be negative all the time. I'm trying to say we just need to be honest about who we are. Can you imagine the freedom in that? Can you imagine being a part of a community where you have nothing to fear in being honest with the people around you? Because you know, they're not gonna use that against you. They're not gonna think less of you, but they're gonna encourage and support you. And some people might say, you know what, me too. Imagine the freedom and joy of that. But as it is, we allow dishonesty to creep into the church, and I think there are a couple things that it does that we need to acknowledge. First of all, dishonesty dishonors. It dishonors our creator, uh, who is um, truth, like he is truth. And so when we're dishonest, it's dishonoring to our creator who made us, who knows us. We can't fool him. This is why Peter said, hey, you're not just lying to us, but you're lying to God. You're trying to trick God into thinking that you're somebody you're not. Do you think you're fooling him? No, he knows who you are. So don't dishonor God by being dishonest about who you are. And dishonesty destroys relationships. It just absolutely does. Some of you can think of times when you found out that someone you care about had been lying to you. How did that feel? Man, it's just, it just breaks you, doesn't it? It breaks trust. It's painful. It destroys relationships. But here's, here's what we have to know. Is that destruction is happening even when the truth doesn't come out. 
When we uh, had a house down in southern Indiana uh, 10 or 12 years ago, and we were doing a remodel on the bathroom, and when we pulled up the flooring, we found mold and water damage. Um, not great. So we started trying to explore where this is coming from because it doesn't really help to, to fix that if we don't know where the water's coming from. And we traced it into the kitchen. We started pulling up flooring in the kitchen, and lo and behold, water damage, mold in the kitchen because there was a leak in the dishwasher that we didn't know about. Um, so we just put in new flooring, covered it all up so that it looked nice on the outside and didn't do anything about the flooring. Is that what we did? You're like, please, I hope not. Please tell me you didn't do that. No, that's not what we did, right? I mean, that's not, again, that's not response. Sorry, buddy. That's not responsible <laughs> adult living. Like, whether you can see it or not, that destruction is there and it's eroding the foundation of our floor that we need to walk on and it needs to hold up our furniture and all that stuff. Dishonesty is like that. Even when you can't see it, it's eroding things. You think like, oh, it would be so much worse if I told them the truth. No, there's damage happening now. And the truth is what gives you a chance to fix it and move on. So as annoying and frustrating as it was to find that mold, I'm glad we found it, right? Man, if you're gonna be honest with somebody, you, you gotta face the reality that like it's doing damage now, even if they don't know about it. And the only way forward is to uncover it and begin to work on the problem. Dishonesty dishonors, it destroys. And so what do we need to do? We need to practice humble honesty. This is our step, uh, humble honesty. Here's a few things that I think we can do to move in that direction. Uh, first is to practice vulnerability. That just means I'm gonna be uh, honest about my weaknesses. That if you ask me on a Sunday morning how I'm doing, if I'm not doing fine, I'll tell you. That's a commitment I'm making to you right now. So some of you are like, okay, uh, note to self, don't ask Adam how he's doing on Sunday morning. Um, but I just think in our church community, we have to be willing to do that. Now, I'm not saying you have to disclose everything in your life to everybody. Please don't do that either, right? That's not necessarily healthy and safe but you should have people in your life that you do that with, that you can say all of the things to, but at least don't lie to people about how you're doing. At least be honest. Um, so practicing that vulnerability moves us in the direction of health. Um, next uh, is to protect the weaknesses of others. And I, I think this is um, kind of the flip side of, of honesty and, and, and truth is that sometimes out of selfishness, we will use the truth to hurt people. Um, maybe that's happened to you. Someone has told you a very painful, unpleasant, mean thing and then said, well, sorry, it's just true. Is the truth an excuse to hurt someone? No. Does that mean you had lied to them? No. But I mean, we had to figure this out. We had to find ways to be honest without using the truth as a weapon to just beat people over the head with. Paul says in Ephesians 4, when he's describing the life of the church, he says, we're gonna be speaking the truth to each other in love, in love. And in verse 29 of that chapter, he says, we're gonna say whatever is useful for building others up. Is it useful for building people up if you just beat them over the head with painful truths about themselves? No. We have to find a way to be honest and be helpful with the truth. And finally, we need to repent from gossip. This doesn't sound like it's related to dishonesty, but I believe that it is. Um, I, I, uh, have you ever, so, all right, let's back up. I, things get back to me. Uh, not everything gets back to me. My guess is about 10% of the things that are said about our church get back to me. And in that 10%, I have heard things over the last few years um, that I'm not even gonna list them. They're absolutely insane about things that are supposedly happening at our church or happened in our church that are absolutely false. And they've gotten back to me and I thought like, this is out there? Why, why didn't somebody come and ask me if this is actually true? Because I could have solved this problem for somebody. But, but for some reason, people have said things and they've been spread and then sort of, more, you know how gossip works, it just morphs into something crazy and then it gets back to you that, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not even gonna go into it. It's just, it's terrible. So 
It, have you done that? Like, have you shared information that you didn't verify? It, you're not, you're not 100% sure it's true, but somebody told you and you trust them and so it's probably true and so you told somebody else and look, don't do that. <laughs> Just stop it, <laughs> right? What, what about this? Have you ever shared something that you thought was true at the time? You found out later that it's not true. Did you go back and correct your story with all the people that you shared it with? If not, there are people out there believing things that are not true because of you. Stop it. Like, just cut it out. This, is, this erodes relationships, this dishonesty, it's that mold under the flooring. Whether you can see it or not, it is doing damage. Just knock it off, right? If you hear something, you want to verify it, or maybe don't say anything at all. Some stories are not yours to tell. Some information is not yours to share, right? Don't, don't share any information that's not yours to share, it is related to dishonesty because I think it's part of, of us trying to feel important. There's, there's some sense of like, I, I like sharing news with, I like to be the one to share the news with people, right? Well, that's, that's me caring more about what people think I am than who I actually am. What God is concerned about is not what everybody thinks I am, but who I actually am. What helps our church be healthy is not who people think you are, but who you actually are right? So we got to cut that stuff out. And when we do, here's the good news. You're like, this, is, this has been a very negative sermon. I don't like this. Um, well, we'll do it again next week. So um, when, we do, when we do this, when we cut this stuff out, here's the great thing. So you remember at the end of chapter uh, four, hi friends, this means we're going to have a baptism later. I just want you guys to get excited about that. Um, so uh, when, when we get this right, so at the end of chapter four, you remember in Acts, things are going great in the church, it's all good, utopian. Then this happens, Ananias and Sapphira happens, everyone's terrified. What do you think happens next? Does this sound like a catalyst for good things or for people to leave? It's a catalyst for good things. Here's the next verse, verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and were added to their number. Somehow, this tragic surgery that happened in the church led to good things. It, it led to, to power, the Holy Spirit being unleashed, and more and more people coming to Christ. And when, when we face up to the dishonesty in our own hearts and in our own relationships, and we cut that stuff out, and it, it, it gives the Spirit room to do amazing things in us and through us, both as individuals and as a church family. So I just wanna encourage you, like we're gonna, we're gonna pray about this. I just wanna encourage you to humbly go before God, ask the Holy Spirit to convict you. Is there any way that you have, you're, you're being dishonest about who you are with people in your life? And what would it take to correct that? Vulnerability, the first thing you're gonna think is, well, that's, that's, I don't wanna do that. I don't want them to find out. I don't want anybody to know that surgery is gonna be painful. But there are things on the other side of that you just, you're, you don't have access to right now because that thing is holding you back. So let's, let's just humbly, honestly go before the Spirit and ask for conviction and the courage to repent. Let's do that together. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, hear this message, even when it's one we don't really want to hear, but um, we need it. And so my prayer is that you would work in me, convict me, Father, of anything in me that's not honest about who I really am, and that uh, I would have the courage just to correct that and make that right and be true uh, to the people around me. And I pray the same for my brothers and sisters here this morning, that we would have the courage to face up to the dishonesty in our hearts in our minds and that sometimes comes out of our mouths and that we would have the confidence in you that we can face that and root it out and we'll still be loved and accepted. Would you do that in us and through us? In Christ's name we pray, amen. So friends, when we get this right, when we get this right, people are drawn to Jesus. We're like a city on a hill that draw people to Jesus. We see this show up in the in this narrative in Acts, right? So I just wanna encourage you, this is, uh, something that can really help not just uh, you individually and not just our church, 
as a family, but actually be a benefit to our entire community. So um, we're going to um, focus on that together.